in Futures and Innovation at the Institute for Security Studies. Please note that we would like to request you to please keep your microphones and cameras turned off until we reach the question and answers portion for today's event. We will be taking questions, answers and comments using the chat function and the raise hand function on your Zoom application. To access the chat function, kindly scroll to the bottom of your Zoom application, click on the chat button and the chat box will appear. Should you wish to raise your hand, kindly click on the participants button on the right hand side of your Zoom application. You will see the participants list just below that, as well as the raise hand button. The chair will then acknowledge you and you will have to unmute your own microphone to make your comment or ask your question. Please note that we will evaluate this event using a poll. The evaluation is completely anonymous and it helps us to present better events in the future. Kindly do take a moment to complete it. It will be launched directly after the presentation portion after today's event. As we wait for the final participants to join us today, we kindly remind you to please keep your microphone muted and your cameras turned off and your own question and answer portion for today's event. Please note, this is... Uh, good, off good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, it's about 10 o'clock, so I'd like us to start. Uh, I think additional people are still joining us. So our seminar today is from lockdown to recovery, South Africa's economic outlook. South Africa is clearly stuck. We face challenges that have been accentuated by the impact of, co of the COVID pandemic, high unemployment, income inequality, low growth and poor governance, state capture and corruption to name just a few. My work has taught me that the orientation and the leadership of the governing elite is key to growth. South Africa has a serious problem in this regard. We have a governing party that is almost tearing itself apart, divided between competing factions while simultaneously trying to keep traditional leaders, labor, uh, <clears throat> and from others from very different ideological perspectives, all within the same big tent. Second, government labor and uh, the private sector seem unable to get to a growth compact. And there've been many attempts, uh, a growth compact that actually translates into implementation. And so we often ask ourselves, what will be different this time? This time? My name is Yaki Silia. I do long-term forecasting and I've been at the Institute for Security Studies for many years. I'm the chair of today's discussion. Uh, given that focus and my work, we're going to try and take a long-term view to 2030 when that is possible. At the ISS, we have uh, authored a number of studies that look at the long-term future of South Africa and I'll refer to some of this. Just to repeat a few of the housekeeping uh, rules that we heard. Uh, the panelists will keep our cameras on. Uh, if we ask that the rest of you in the audience, please uh, switch your cameras off and mute yourself if you are not speaking. Uh, you're welcome to use the chat function at the bottom um, uh, of your screen. Uh, hopefully we'll have a bit of a lively discussion um, and uh, I encourage you to make comments and raise questions and so on. Use the hand raise function uh, during question and answer session, scroll to the bottom, uh, click on the participant list and uh, there you will find the hand raise function and please uh, drop your hand when, your question, when you have been acknowledged and you have posed your question. So what we're going to do is we're first going to have a discussion between the four, uh, the four panelists, myself included, um, and at the end then we will turn to questions and discussions with the audience. And uh, as TJ mentioned, we'll have a, quest, a, a inval short evaluation uh, event form that you have to participate. And uh, finally, we are going to conclude sharply at 11.30. So we have uh, a number of eminent panelists. Um, we have Miriam Altman, professor of uh, four, um, uh, uh, four hour practices at the School of Economics, University of Johannesburg. We have Anne Bernstein, executive director of the Center for Development and Enterprise in Johannesburg. And Jongdu Dai Park, ambassador of the Republic of Korea to South Africa, based in Pretoria. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. So we're going to discuss um, with the, the seminar is going to proceed uh, in the in the following uh, sequence. And I'm just going to, um, as I'm going to do uh, on a few occasions, share my screen just to show you uh, the uh, names and the title of the um, discussions that we are having today. We are first going to start on uh, South Africa's growth prospects. Then we're going to look at the role of government versus the private sector, South Africa's fiscal situation, employment in the employment and in uh, in the informal sector, 
Uh, we're going to look at energy electricity. We can't uh, have a seminar without discussing ESCOM. Uh, we're going to look at the potential of infrastructure to unlock growth, industrialization and trade, and then we will turn to the discussion. Um, so I would like to show you a slide that comes from work at the ISS that sort of captures our current dilemma. So in this year, according to the IMF, South Africa will contract, we'll have about uh, minus 8% growth. And then depending if we have a V or a U-shaped economic recovery, uh, the impact of COVID, we could have either 1.5% average growth until 2030 or about 0.9%. Now, many of you will remember uh, the National Development Plan had a, a forecast completely unrealistic now, if we look back at it, at 5.4% average growth rate till 2030. Now, these rates of growth, 1.5, 0.9%, are significantly below any rate able to alleviate poverty, reduce inequality, or grow employment. In actual fact, if we then look at what that impact is on poverty, now, uh, we have about 40, South Africa's got extraordinary high levels of, of extreme poverty. If we use uh, the $5.50 benchmark for upper middle income countries from the World Bank, we have about 49% people in living in extreme poverty last year. And that will change to about 48 or 50% um, by 2030. Now you'll see um, our population, which is already at about 60 million, will increase to about 67 million uh, by then. So in our view, South Africa is clearly at a crossroads. Our current development trajectory is uh, increasingly untenable. And we are falling further and further behind uh, our peers. Um, so the question really then is what, what can be done uh, to deal with this situation? So in the first part, let's look at growth prospects. And Miriam, I'd like to start with you if possible. Um, you know about government and state-owned enterprises, having worked in both. Um, amongst other roles, you serve as a commissioner of the National Planning Commission, where you lead the work on economy, digital readiness, labor, state-owned enterprises, performance, uh, and on education. But I need, obviously, to emphasize that you're participating in your private capacity. What, what is your view on South Africa's growth and the development prospects looking out to 2030? What needs to change and, and how? Uh, Yaki, thanks for uh, for inviting me to this uh, talk, and thanks for the papers uh, that you've provided, which I found very helpful and and very close to the mark uh, of what needs to be done. Um, I'd like to cut to the chase, though the pl the plan is is sometimes stated as as maybe not being relevant anymore. In my view, it's completely relevant still. the The implementation's been slow. There's no doubt, but you know, you need a a North Star, people, people feel cynical about, uh, you know, we can't do this. Well, we have to do it. It's, it's an expression of our constitutional aspiration. And because we have not yet gotten to that does not mean that it's not relevant and needs to be done. It ne means we need to double up. And cynicism is actually what's gonna kill us. As hard as that is, that is exactly what is going to kill us, is the cynicism and withdrawal of, uh, of commitment. So uh, now the work of the Planning Commission and particularly uh, the work that, that uh, I've been leading and others have been leading around uh, looking at the economy, I'd like to zero down to one area, which is about public management. So we have this tendency, and I'm often raising this in government circles and also in the private sector. We love to produce these lists of stuff we need to do. Like for example, we need to release spectrum, we need to procure energy, uh, et cetera. We need to build uh, multimodal transport facilities and so on. Nothing wrong with that. And then we spend endless amounts of time negotiating almost the same list year after year in NEDLAC. And yet we don't make progress. So the work that um, I know I'm speaking in my private capacity, but the work that I've been leading at uh, in, in the Planning Commission uh, has focused on asking all the researchers and everyone who's involved, what goes wrong? Everybody wants infrastructure. You've got the budgets. Uh, you know, to take one example, nobody says they don't want to do infrastructure, and yet low quality, poor expenditure, corruption, etc. So what goes wrong? So the essence of what we've been putting uh, uh, the majority of our effort to 
is how to rebuild state capacity. Because if there's one thing that has really gone backwards, you know, in many cases, it's more about stasis, as you've said. But the problem is when you're looking long range, as you know, you're thinking about the pathway is the foundation mm -hmm. there for growth. So it's not just are things going badly now, but is there a foundation? And the key issue is that the institutions have become weaker, state capacity has been undermined, and that was a particular feature of our state capture. You can have corruption, and I'm not certainly not advocating corruption, but you can also see major delivery, as you've seen in um, some of the countries that are represented here, um, you know, have, have corruption and evidence of corruption, but, uh, but they deliver. And the problem for us now is that it is overwhelmed and undermined capacity. Mm -hmm. And the number one question that, that then arises is, you don't need another list of stuff to do. What we have to ask is who's gonna do it? How will it be done? How will it get delivered? Stabilizing leaderships, strengthening systems of accountability. Not everybody is excited about that stuff, but that is the heart of what needs to happen in South Africa now if we want to get onto a, that kind of NDP uh, mm -hmm. and constitutional tra trajectory. Mariam, that, that's very much, I must say, very much how I see it as well. Um, I'm often um, frustrated, as we all are, by the focus on corruption and state capture, whereas that is important. But um, state lack of capacity, and I'm going to use a strong word, incompetence, is often as perhaps even more important. Um, but when, I, I mean, I was on a webinar that you chaired a while ago when I listened to plans on infrastructure and so on and so forth. And I was struck by how complex, um, again, state procurement and everything else is. And I was saying to myself, wow, is it really possible for, for government, given this capacity problem, to implement uh, the kind of infrastructure drive and so on um, that, that we all know has to happen? You know, what is the, what is the way that we fast track that, that we overcome that capacity challenge? Well, this is why the focus of the work in the Planning Commission has been on exactly that. So that, you know, what I find both in the private sector and in the public sector, if you look at all the documents, the issue of state capacity, it's always stated as a top priority, but it's always the last slide or the last page. And it says, we need leadership, mm, right? That's true. So what we're trying to say is, but that is the number one issue now in South Africa. It's not about trying to figure out what to do. You know, we could improve policy for sure, but that's, that should not be the top priority right now. Right now, it should be about stabilizing leadership, accountability, and the strength of institutions, the human capacity that the public sector becomes a, a career of choice. The reality right. is, as much as we talk about, say, reforming electricity markets, remember, somebody has to do it. When you say you want to improve telecommunication services, you may want to privatize, but who's going to privatize? <laughs> Somebody, you know, the capacity has to be in place. You can't get around the fact that 30% mm. of the economy is the state. And if you want to even un unlock the mon state monopolies, you have to have state capacity. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's something we don't talk about enough. People say, oh, the private sector will do it. Well, the private sector can't do it like that. The state has to have some central capability to drive the kinds of change, even if it involves privatization, it requires yeah. that state capacity. So what we've been doing, and I, what I can do is I can give links to different reports if you like to the participants. What we've been doing is step-by-step -step around SO, state-owned enterprise, uh, public procurement infrastructure, education, and all the key cross-cutting areas of the economy that make it go. What, yeah. need, what could, not everything, but what are a number of things that would get us moving? Because what I've learned, you, you know that I've been involved in a number of change programs, most recently um, leading the change at Telcom as, as chief of strategy in that turnaround. And what I've learned the hard way over my professional life is, you know, a big strategy is great, but you've got to take a first step. You know, yeah. you've got to move and, 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 and start somewhere and do what you can do and what's within your power to do and try that out and then have a learning journey. And that's how we did the telecom change. And that's why- You, we, know, you know the old adage that, that uh, you know the old adage that culture always beats strategy, which is, I think is, is very, very true in a, in a way. But I think, Miriam, that actually sets us up for, for turning to, to Anne 
Anne Bernstein, who is the executive director at the Center for Development and Enterprise based in Johannesburg. Now, CDE has published widely on uh, the role of growth, employment, education, and business, and uh, both uh, particularly in South Africa, but also in developing uh, economies. So Anne, from your perspective, sitting in Johannesburg, uh, what, what are our growth prospects and what do you think needs to, needs to be done? Well, thanks, Yaki, and I'm delighted to be here with everyone. Um, let, me, let me build on what Miriam said and take it in a slightly different direction. Um, I think South Africa has enormous potential to be a great African lion, but it always disappoints. And now we're in a very deep cycle of decline. And the truth is that the country cannot make progress if we continue along the same lines. We have to rethink many attitudes and policies that have brought the country to the sorry state. Now, there are a number of priorities. The state is absolutely vital. And if you read all the recovery strategies, um, which seems to be one of our only growth industries at the moment, you will see that people defer to this issue. They say, yes, state capacity, very important. And then they come with an enormous number of recommendations that ignore the fact that the state is possibly broken, certainly weak, corrupt, and not performing. That's a very difficult situation to be in. So the president has said, we have to fix the state. Yes, we need some milestones for, let's call it a short, medium, and long-term approach to fixing the state. But what nobody wants to think about when it comes to growth, is what do we do tomorrow? Because I think this has been illustrated very clearly if you didn't understand it before during COVID and what happened in many dimensions of our response, the weak, corrupt state wasn't able to do all sorts of things. So part of the state challenge is what Miriam's saying, but it is also, what are we going to do tomorrow? Because if you look at everybody's list of how we get growth going, it requires capacity in the state. Because obviously, you've got to regulate, you have to manage all sorts of things. So I think that's one dimension that nobody wants to talk about and wants to avoid. And that affects our growth prospects dramatically. The second um, thing I would say is that South Africa sits today in this very difficult situation because it's extraordinarily difficult to accept how weak the state is. On the other hand, we do have a private sector that is certainly not perfect, but needs to be freed up as much as possible in order to do what they can do. And of course, you need to regulate and do all sorts of things because the private sector, there are people in the private sector who can take you to the cleaners which is exactly what's been happening. But it's an attitude change. Unless we have a new attitude to business is not the enemy, but firms, big, small, medium, foreign owned, domestically owned, whatever, firms are capacity and markets will give South Africa some capacity to grow. So I think a new attitude to the private sector is a fundamental um, prerequisite for getting, our, getting us out of many of the crises that we face. And then the third thing I would say is that we are in deep trouble when it comes to our growth and employment prospects if we keep endlessly compacting. I'm opposed to that. I'm in favor of leadership. In a parliamentary democracy, I want leadership from those elected, and that's primarily the president he can use compacting to bring people around what he wants to do, but to assume that you can get the lowest common denominator from a group of current interests to come up with a plan for South Africa to grow is I think not going to work. So my view is we need to stop tweaking. We must stop avoiding the hard policy issues and choices that are fundamental to growth. We all know what they are in terms of getting faster growth. We talk a lot less about getting more inclusive growth. For me, 
primarily jobs. We can talk about education and skills later, but we have to reform. You can't avoid this. So we have English summits, we have all sorts of conversations, we have the social partners doing this. This is not getting South Africa anywhere in the last two and a half years. So we have to bite, to use a terrible phrase, bite the bullet. And that requires leadership and a vision of how growth much faster, more inclusive, could be the key transformative, revolutionary transformative agent for getting South Africa to a different place, providing hope and providing jobs and the wealth that we need to distribute as, as, as best we can. And that, that uh, it, what you're saying reminds me very much of what happened with gear, the much maligned gear. But, uh, you know, my impression of gear is very much that what happened is that uh, Tabum Beke at the time focused on a number of key issues, macroeconomic issues, and that unleashed um, what was South Africa's uh, post-1994 most rapid period of growth and employment. Is that, uh, so you, you're speaking about leadership, but you're also speaking uh, about prioritization and action, I, I assume. Look, yeah, we're certainly leadership, but at no point have we seen, did we see Harbo and Becky or key leaders in the ANC going around the country within the ANC, never mind the wider society, and making the case for a more market-oriented approach to growth. It was couched in, you know, Marxist language and and all sorts of things. So I don't think we've seen ideas leadership coupled with, you know, changing the narrative. That is really important. Mm -hmm. In Mr. Mandela's head or Mr. Becky's head, it's how you take everyone with you that we have to move in a different direction. That's one thing. I think the second thing is there wasn't a wholehearted change of approach. And from 2004, the famous document on the 10-year review of South Africa's democracy, which said when you ask the private sector to do anything, it doesn't happen. We have to rely more on the state. And I think without the commodity boom and a number of other things, we wouldn't have had such a good period in the 2000s. So, well done, we did that. And we did the lie that we, it was jobless growth. We got 2 million new jobs in the period, at least probably a bit more. Um, but these were mainly for more skilled people. And I think there wasn't sufficient leadership in terms of a change of direction. So I am not talking about, I am talking about a new vision for the country and recognition that we have to change our mindset. We have to change attitudes, which then leads to policy change. And you know, you're not going to deal with poverty in South Africa if you're anti-business, and you're not going to get growth if you're anti-business. So if you look at the recovery strategies on the table, all sorts of things we can say, but I think it's fair to say that the National Treasury proposed reforms and the business reform in broad measure want to enable firms, markets, competitiveness. If you, the ANC document does have some movement, but in the main, I would say that and the Alliance document, they want to discipline capital and they want a bigger role for the state. And I think those two are just in South Africa's circumstances now, those are the wrong mindset to have, um, you know, whatever our ultimate goal is. So yeah. those are the two big issues for me. Yeah, Thank, thanks, Anne. Um, you know, we've, um, I've done at the, at the ISS, we've done a number of country studies across Africa, ranging from Tunisia, Algeria, uh, to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. And Southern Africa really has a challenge in terms of the liberation era, uh, ideology that still that still dominates, but I now want to turn to uh, to Ambassador uh, Park, um, and uh, I'm going to again uh, just show a, a slide, because Ambassador Park, you uh, last year published a remarkable book which I enjoyed very much, 
uh, called Reinventing South Africa's Development, where you sought to draw lessons from Africa from the Korean uh, development model. It's, a, it's really a great read and well-written and easy accessible. So what I've shown is I'm showing a graph that shows GDP per capita um, in 2019 constant dollars for Korea versus uh, South Africa. And I think, you know, um, South Korea was considerably poorer than South Africa at independence. Mm -hmm. And today it's a, it's a high income country. Uh, in a, and while we are in an extended low growth middle income trap, uh, in 1960s, you can see on the graph, GDP per capita in mm -hmm. South Korea was half that of South Africa. You close the gap in 1987, and today our GDP per capita is one third of yours. I mean, it's a dismal picture. Uh, and that gap, the graph is out, uh, has a forecast until 2030 will widen. Um, so uh, that single graph captures in my mind um, so much uh, of, of South Africa. Now, um, on the one hand, sorry, I'm just uh, want to stop that 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 share. Um, so we are standing still while Korea is forging ahead. And in your book, you write that in, in essence, in uh, if if in if anything, in essence, Africa's chronic poverty is not due to lack of resources or means, but to what we can cursorily describe as a management problem. I guess South Africa epitomizes this challenge. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Ambassador Park, from your perspective, and I, I know you as a diplomat will be quite careful, but what are we, <laughs> why are we getting it so wrong? Help us. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Yaki and uh, Professor Altman and Director President. It was a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, presentation you start with. So, uh, I have to be a little bit, you know, uh, of course, uh, diplomatic. So, let me start by... Uh, what I think was crucial for our success, but which is very relevant to South Africa. Uh, I can see that it comes together. And uh, so uh, it can come down to three things, essentially. Uh, first of all, uh, to get out of all the difficulties, because always um, economic development, realizing growth uh, has not been easy. Of course, we are in a very difficult situation. Uh, in the pandemic, but even in the ordinary times to achieve uh, economic growth that is more uh, inclusive and sustainable, it's very difficult for you know, developing countries to do. And the three th key things I think is, first of all, there has to be uh, economic principle applied. These days all around the world, even uh, you know, rich countries, always there's a politics involved. So you cannot you know, avoid politics, but at least there should be a room where you have a genuine economic principle play out. So when economy and politics and all other things are mixed together, uh, there's no way to grow. So that is very important. Uh, for example, uh, one area we see worldwide uh, where there's no accident and no major, you know, uh, the crisis problem is in the, you know, uh, international, you know, uh, uh, flights, you know, uh, aeronautics, because politics, uh, politicians are not involved because it's very specialized professional area. So you don't see many planes, you know, crashing. It's very few because the professionals are doing the work. So let economy first do its work and we can talk about things that can, can come later. So the basic is economic principle is very important. And second thing is we cannot uh, you know, emphasize enough on uh, human capital. So this uh, lack of capacity that we are talking about, the leadership is crucial, uh, but uh, you know, uh, Armata Sen, who is a Nobel you know, economics uh, laureate, uh, he came up with the famous you know, uh, theory of capacity. Capacity is very important for government, for people, and the leader is important, but uh, you know, leader himself, he cannot you know, solve all the problems. So there has to be a team, you know, bureaucrats uh, working with him who has to act. And it all comes down to uh, sort of a, you know, a personal capacity. We can say is a human capacity or even you know, social capacity to working together. So that is crucial, but in many cases lacking. Mostly people, you know, uh, emphasize about the financial capital, material capital, 
as if it, that's the only thing that matters, getting money from IMF, but it won't you know, uh, change anything. If people's uh, behavior, making use of it doesn't change. And lastly, it's accountability. It's not a, a accountability in a legal term strictly only for the minister, high officials, it's for everybody. Not only government officials, but businessmen as well. And even ordinary people, they should be accountable. That's strictly about you know, law or abiding you know, the obligation, but also performance. So government uh, you know, officials, they should be accountable to their work targets. They should be assessed. Uh, they should be you know, uh, you know, uh, pressurized to do their work. And if they didn't, they don't perform, they should be held accountable accordingly. So there has to be consequences. And also ordinary people, citizens, they should be citizens uh, that who is responsible. So they have also, you know, stake in being responsible, uh, uh, working for, you know, community good, welfare. So everybody has this uh, responsibility. So I think these three factors is most important. And now we are in the COVID-19. Uh, even before COVID, uh, the world was uh, doing, you know, a very, you know, uh, you know, badly in terms of uh, economic growth, and uh, it was a deglobalizing trend, and there was a new normal: uh, low growth, low interest rates, low employment, and low, you know, globalization. It's a deglobalization, but this pandemic has uh, only magnified the problems uh, all the countries have. So this is the time when supposedly using this crisis as an opportunity, leadership and government should come and really think about changing what we need to change. Uh, but uh, just going back to normal, I think it's the most uh, dangerous thing. So that I think we need to be aware of. So yeah, I, I will stop at that. Thank you very much, Ambassador Park. So uh, get the economists to run the, the, the economy, invest in human capital and hold people accountable. You know, I. Uh, when I wrote a book on the future of Africa, South Africa a few years ago, and I, I at that point wrote that ANC stands for absolutely no accountability. Um, I won't ask you to comment on that, but um, that is changing. And um, of the culture changes that have to happen uh, within our management that we referred a little bit earlier when Miriam was speaking, that really is, is, is absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, Miriam made the, the point that um, she made it in a, in a very diplomatic way that South Korea has also had significant levels of corruption. And you and I have previously discussed this. So what is the difference between corruption in South Korea versus corruption in South Africa? Okay, thank you. So, uh, you know, there was always uh, this problem of, uh, you know, governance and even uh, rich countries uh, when they were developing and still, you see uh, today uh, there's a, you know uh, irregularities. That's why we need a strong system of accountability, and that's why we need so a strong you know uh, a mutual kind of uh, you know surveillance system. Uh, you can call that as a you know system of uh, accountability, and that's crucial. So it is always there, uh, but it's one thing to you know stress about the good governance, rule of law. But if you don't carry out the necessary things, uh, how can you, you know, achieve uh, the goal you're supposed to, you know, achieve or provide for the public? So I think the most crucial thing is uh, the public service, uh, government as a whole, not you know, delivering the things uh, that's needed. Because in this situation like this, uh, uh, where we are in crisis, uh, even you know, advanced countries, uh, they look uh, up to the government to provide the support. It's crucial. Uh, the government's role is becoming more and more important, and the government and businesses both are important. So it's not choosing one over the other. Both of them should be more aggressively doing their work. But when uh, the basic, you know, uh, where do you start? That's right. So Professor Altman, you uh, rightly, you know, uh, point out, it has to start somewhere, and it has to start in the government. And when uh, people are not uh, behaving or doing their work as they are supposed to, then you can have all the good plans, uh, you know, roadmaps, all the financial assistance, and all the good, you know, uh, blueprints and conclusions. But still, uh, the, you know, your backs are slide. So I think that's a big difference that can be made. And I think you should start with uh, re, uh, 
invigorating and reforming the government sector and very, you know, in a, a strategic way. Uh, and that's the thing I think is very important. Thank you very much. You know, um, academically, of course, the difference between historically, the difference between corruption in Asia and in Africa was always presented that what happened in Asia is that the, the corrupt money stayed and greased the economic <laughs> wheels. Whereas in Africa, um, all the money went to the US or to Switzerland or France or the UK. Now, that certainly is changing in South Africa. I mean, if you look at the conspicuous consumption of our political elites, um, certainly, they are reinvesting their corrupt monies inside South Africa. But in any case, let's move to the role of government and the private sector. We've already touched on that. Um, so this is on the state and SOE capacity. And um, you also, in your first response, um, you made the point, uh, well, you, um, you referred to that, but the private sector is often presented as an alternative implementation agency. But certainly, if you, the way I look at it, if you leave it to the private sector, uh, the development trajectory would probably only further increase poverty and inequality. And one of the recent op-eds uh, from you had the title, if the state is largely broken, who will implement the reforms we need? What role can then uh, business play? Now, you've, you've referred to this previously, but would you like to expand on that? Sure. I think that it's an enormous dilemma. All three of us agree, all four of us agree, we need an effective, capable, merit-driven state with the right professional capacity. And in South Africa, that will take time because you've got to get rid of a whole lot of corrupt and senior people who've been appointed for the wrong reasons. So um, that is the big dilemma. Now, in that context, I would be saying, we're in an enormous crisis on every front. South Africa faces crisis, whether it's, you know, delivery from the SOEs or the fiscal crisis, which most people want to avoid, or the unemployment or the growth crisis. So we're in a tremendous crisis. And in this context, to be faffing around with how we fund SAA rather than what's what South Africa need for tourism and growth in terms of an aviation industry. So we spend far too much time on the wrong topics. So the first point I would make is it's time to really look at what needs to be privatized or some kind of moved out of the state and what's essential for the state to fix. And how are we going to do that? And some sense of urgency would be much appreciated. So prioritization and urgency. I'm not saying the private sector can fix everything. Of course not. You need a state, you need markets, competitive market-friendly rules, but you need a smart state, as they had in South Korea and elsewhere, that understands markets and what's possible. But we don't have it, and we're not going to have that for the next few years. So in the context of crisis, I would say we've got to look at every single way, every sector where we have capacity and how to free that up as much as possible. So it's not a holist bonus thing. I disagree that you know, more private sector means more inequality and so on. We can debate that for a long time. I am absolutely in favor of people paying their tax. You and me, big companies, government people, cabinet ministers, everyone should pay their tax then my tax money has to be spent really effectively and well. But I'm in favor of that. And South Africa has an enormous amount of redistribution, some of which works well and is impressive in the developing country context. But we can't subsidize, we can't feed the nation, and we can't subsidize the nation. You have to get growth. And in order to get growth, you have to, I, I'm going to repeat myself, you have to have a new attitude to the, to the private sector, to markets. You don't close down the informal sector when you're opening, you know, sponsor shops were closed when supermarkets were open. This is crazy. You've got to have a whole different attitude to where South Africa's potential lies and how to maximize that. And then we have to have a very difficult conversation almost sector by sector about what to do tomorrow. So if you're interested in land reform, yes, there is state land, great. 
there seems to be some movement there, but lots of detail unclear in the past week. But the only real capacity in rural South Africa is in commercial agriculture, except that. Now, how do we build on that? How do we build on making this as inclusive and helping to get a black commercial agricultural class and helping smaller farmers as well? If you look at energy, there's lots of private sector could be doing very quickly. Why is it all taken so long? We had some new sort of movement there, but there's, you know, the mines have been offering extra capacity, energy capacity for the grid for ages. Sattel has offered. I'm sure that people are saying that the current independent power producers could do a lot more. So it's, it's recognizing reality. And I don't think enough people understand and appreciate, and certainly our leadership isn't communicating this as effectively as possible, how bad the situation is. Once you recognize that crisis, real crisis, then you'd say, what can we do? You know, how do we make a plan? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff is going on. So I think it affects everything, Yaki. It's not just uh, a few things. And, you know, it, it is ridiculous that we cannot discuss privatization when Danelle can't pay its salaries, when the ports are sort of, you know, the most expensive around, yeah. when yeah. fruit in the Cape <laughs> export more but the port can't deal with their capacity. And the private sector is offering to put money in. So there are all sorts of areas where it's not about, I think it's misleading to think about, oh, you know, firms and the private sector create poverty and inequality. I disagree with that fundamentally. I'm just coming back to the Northern no, I, case. I get the point. I get the point. <laughs> but, but I think it's how we communicate this. You drive yeah. forward, in the Northern Cape, you come to Katu where they're big mines, and this is a fantastic town. The roads are paved, all sorts of things happening because the big companies there are doing some things. Yeah, no, and I, 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 um, I hear you. You know, um, I've previously written, and when you uh, you talk about urgency, you know, urgency in government is like a snail trapped in grease. I mean, there is just absolutely. I, it's 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 just absolutely mind-boggling, you know. We we let Danelle, which actually produces and makes stuff, go under, but we'll fund the SAA. It, and I think the other thing that always struck me is our focus is consistently on redistribution, which is hap more of that has happened than most people know, but not on growth. So you know that that's a, for me. I feel almost as strong about that as I can see you felt. But let me turn to to Miriam. I, I you know you've already mentioned this, Miriam, and and uh, Anne has again mentioned that. But what do you think is the capacity of the state and SOEs? And uh, I, I know you've already mentioned made some remarks in this regard. Um. And I, I think I'll refer back to the growth discussion again uh, as well, if that's okay. So I've, I've mentioned, uh, I've spoken quite a bit about the state capacity issue and what I've done is I've offered links to some of the papers. If I could just say to the participants, for some reason, my links aren't coming through properly. So if you do wanna go to some of the NPC papers, please cut and paste the whole link that I've posted. I, I don't know why it's not coming up entirely correctly. So don't, don't click the links that I've put there. Uh, please cut and paste. Now, so again, what, what we've been doing is doing very extensive studies, and, and in particular on SOEs, we focused on the big infrastructure uh, entities, PRASA, Transnet, and ESCOM, as examples of exactly what are we trying to say about private versus public, around leadership, governance, and accountability, and what specifically needs to be done. And so I've given some links to some of those papers. We've also looked at the character of public procurement and capacity around management of the built environment. And some people will say, well, that's technical. Well, it is technical. What do you, you know, what do you need to do? Now, what I would, what I would say is I have a lot of engagement with the private sector and with the public sector. And there's like a, uh, I don't know how to put it, but a, uh, it's like the body rejects advice around these public management issues. So what my, my goal anyway, as a commissioner, has been to fuel uh, capacity in the state, but also to fuel private voice. We have a free country. We have a free press. We have a democracy. Not every country has that, right? So what I would like the private sector to do 
is to get a lot more specific about what it would like to see, not the list of stuff that needs to happen, like, you, you know, again, procuring energy and concessioning rail. Yes, that stuff needs to happen, but you can't keep banging your head against a wall, you know? So, so, so the narrative needs to change to something that starts saying, and what we want to see is the strengthening of the office of the chief procurement officer, you know, or, or whatever, you know, that the management of the built environment needs to be done in a way that understands how delivery of infrastructure happens and that it's different than procuring other stuff. You know, th things like that, um, that you need longer term contracts. It's boring stuff, it's not exciting. And it's not even economics really. But if we wanna see movement in the economy, these are the things that need to happen. Now I find that both in the public sector and in the private sector, people glaze over. When you start in the, they, they want to see movement, but they don't actually want to talk about this stuff. And it doesn't, it's not taking. It's so interesting to me that these things aren't taking. Now, so I just, I, I just wanted to put that across. And I think that, yeah, yeah. like I said, the private sector voice needs to strengthen around these issues. Now, the other thing I wanted to say on reflection of some of the other things that have been said, we don't believe in growth. And I think there's a reason for that. I've been thinking a lot about this and I have a series in, in Business Maverick that has been unpacking that because as you say, I think the culture point is, is a very big deal. And I think that we have a much bigger hangover from our apartheid years than we would like to admit. And I've been thinking a lot about that and stretching out of my comfort zone in economics to be thinking about the behavioral reasons for stasis, for stagnation. And I think what happens is number one, I don't think people believe in growth. And I think there's a good reason for that. We had stagnation for most of the apartheid period with maybe a few years of growth. We had uh, maybe five to seven years uh, of growth in the 2000s and that's it. So, you know, to, to have an experience of growth and you know, you've, we've got people from Colombia, Korea, Vietnam, uh, I, I didn't see the others who, you know, their starting point was also very difficult. You know, Vietnam came out of 20 years of war, a million people died, you know, North and South, and yet they're bringing the country together. So we don't have a culture, and this, this speaks to your point, Yaki. Um, people don't believe in growth. And so the idea that we're gonna come around and come to agreement around that, you know, that, that's really something that needs to be attended to. Then there's no, because of that, there's no trust. And that makes it very hard, therefore, to then get into partnerships like PPPs, concessioning rail, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things that Anne is, is, is quite rightly raising. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I think that's, that's the heart. I don't think it's the recent experience of corruption. I think this is 40 or 50 years of culture building up. And we're just continuing like that, that approach to the informal sector under COVID, I absolutely agree with Anne, speaks to that historical uh, thinking around how to manage the informal sector. It reminded me a lot of how it was done in, the, in earlier years. Mariam, I find that an amazing statement that you think the private sector does not believe in growth. I, I find that absolutely mind boggling. Um, because my experience is quite the contrary. When I look at the, when you speak of culture that has been brought to South Africa and refer to the social compacting and the consensus, consensus culture, which is very strong within the ANC, Kusatu and the South African Communist Party. And that, um, you know, is an extreme, it's one version of the compacting challenge that we face. But my experience and my research just tells me that if there's anybody that does not believe in growth as the primary uh, orientation, it is very certainly within the ruling alliance, because the focus there is entirely on redistribution. It is not on growth. Prove me wrong. <laughs> Let me clarify what I mean. I spoke about two things. One is, if we want to see change, we need to stop focusing on the list of stuff that needs to be done. Not that it's not important. Mm. And we need to get moving on how and who. That is the number one block mm -hmm. right now. It may not be in 10 years, I hope, but it is right now for sure. There's no rhythm. The routines have broken down. A bureaucracies require routines. It's so boring, but that's the reality. Now they've broken down. I see it everywhere and in every corner of the public sector that every time you wanna procure a pencil, people say, oh, how's that done? 
it should just be a routine. And that's how it was. So um, now the private sector certainly believes in growth. So that's a different point. The private sector is not latching onto the material that's being provided to them. I think, I don't know if it's boring, it's not exciting, but mm. this is what they need to focus on. And what we're trying to do is fuel that so I, that they I, know, yeah, no, because we, I, we have inside information as to how things work. We can get a grip on it. And we're saying to them, this is what you should be fighting for because you don't need to know the detail of how energy should be delivered. What you need to know is that there is a, is a strong board in ESCOM, that there is strong executive management, that it's stable mm -hmm. and that they are able, because it is a monopoly, that it is able to implement the reforms that are required. And that requires stable and strong leadership. And they can dream and worry about it and you can monitor that, but you, you should be less worried about the detail of how we're gonna get energy delivered and more on the quality and stability uh, mm -hmm. and accountability of leadership. Now, so the, now, now that's, a, that's one point. The second point is about growth. So there's no doubt that the private sector, particularly established business, would believe in growth and would want to see it. There's no doubt about that. But then there's the rest, there's, there's a rest uh, of people. You know, um, Ambassador, uh, I, you, you must know Alice Amston and Robert Wade, who in the 1980s, that's when I was studying, in the 1980s were, were fighting the World Bank in terms of their explanation of, of why the Southeast Asian tigers uh, moved ahead. And they had an analysis of the state at that time. And Alice Amston used to write about uh, corruption in Haiti and places like that. And she talked about the lack of belief. So what, what you do is you steal as much as you can because that you, you don't believe in that law. If you believed in the long-term trajectory, then you would wanna get the rents from that long-term trajectory. So when you're a country like China or Vietnam or Korea, I imagine, uh, I'm just thinking about countries that I, I know a little bit better than Korea, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, corruption, but there's no doubt that the population at large believe in the trajectory. People criticize their government much more than you would think in those countries, but they believe in the project and they, well, Think that they're going to benefit from it. Whereas here, some parts of the private sector and, and, and certainly civil society lar at, more at large don't believe that this is for them. Now, right uh, Miriam, that you, you make a, an absolutely critical point about the lack of trust. I think um, Anne also made that point. And I must say that, that the belief in the South African project is really absent across the board. And the problem is that those that um, really have the money and the ability to contribute to that no longer believe in the in the future of South Africa and and this is a huge huge problem I I, I think so yeah trust accountability uh, but you know we go back to Anne's point about the importance of leadership but I want to turn to to Ambassador Park now um, because you're looking from the outside and we're um, banging our heads against the the wall here so uh, in in Korea uh, what role did the state uh, how do you see the role of the business and the state? And what do you think that role could be in South Africa, given its current low growth trajectory? What is the balance? Because in the studies that we do, and I've done a number of studies, probably about 10 detailed studies of African countries, South Africa is one of the few countries that has a dynamic uh, private sector. It's really generally absent in much of Africa. So how do you see it? What was the key state to South Korea's growth miracle? I think that certainly is the popular impression. Okay. Yes, so we have to, I think, stress uh, the key, you know, players. Uh, private sector is, of course, uh, they're the ones uh, who have to innovate and grow the economy. They're the principal uh, players, you know, we cannot, you know, argue with that. But the government plays an important role. So government plays a diff little bit different role uh, than private sector. Private sector uh, rightfully, uh, is the you know uh, owner of the economy and the driving force, and also we cannot uh, also downplay importance of market because uh, people so much you know bash you know neoliberalism, uh, but we cannot you know uh, underestimate the importance of markets. Uh, uh, so markets, private sector, you know enterprises, government, I think they're the iron triangle. 
the Holy Trinity, uh, Trinity you can say, uh, that is important. And uh, there should not be a misunderstanding on the, what is the you know, uh, desirable government role. Uh, government uh, you know, should not you know, just meddle or should not decide for itself uh, how you know, economy you know, uh, is run or flows, but uh, rather act as a you know, facilitator. So in our case, uh, you know, Korea, uh, why we were able to manage to realize uh, rapid growth in early stages is somehow government uh, acted as a facilitator to help the private sector um, do their business. Uh, not in terms of uh, picking winners, there's a great misunderstanding uh, in the you know, textbooks uh, as if the uh, you know, Korean model is government uh, picking winners. It's the, the other way around. Uh, the government shielded you know, uh, politics from influencing the economy. So what our government did was uh, not let politics influence economics and uh, introduced the rule of a competition. So it's kind of a, a meritocracy, you can say. Uh, so those uh, small companies uh, which did well, uh, they were rewarded in terms of their performance. So it was actually competition that brought up uh, chapels, you know, the LG, Samsung, Hyundai, Kia, you know, SK, Postco, you see, they all started from very small companies and they were able to grow because uh, they were rewarded in kind in terms of uh, their actual uh, outcome, you know, results, output, how much they exported, how much they employed, and they uh, became big. Of course, they also, you know, embody some problems coming from be becoming too big. But uh, generally, um, the state, uh, you know, helped the economy uh, run its course uh, economically. Mm. So I think that is important. So these days, I also agree with you. You know, growth is very important. Uh, before this pandemic. Uh, even in uh, you know OECD in those organizations, people were talking about you know well-being economy uh, beyond GDP. Uh, but COVID you know uh, pandemic uh, you know uh, makes us realize that still growth is very important because people so many people are losing their jobs, mm. and look how you know the GDP is being downgraded. Uh, some countries minus uh, twenty percent, ten percent. South Africa is also there. So it means that uh, we cannot uh, disregard the fundamentals of eco economy. Of course, we can have inclusive growth, economic growth coming with more equitable distribution, quality of life. But I think if they are you know, interconnected together, so you cannot just uh, pick one and uh, think the other will automatically follow. Uh, so that's very important. So the private sector is key and the government should uh, play the role of supporting the private sector. But the uh, government has a lot of you know, uh, work to do. And actually, it actually contributes a lot. For example, when you see government expenditure uh, compared to GDP, a government plays a huge role in every country. Mm -hmm. uh, United States is, mo is the most uh, liberal economy, but the government expenditure uh, compared to GDP is uh, like a 35%. Most of OECD countries are 40%. One of the highest is France is about 55%. So you cannot you know, uh, neglect the role of government, which means uh, the government bureaucracy is that much important yeah. for suppress, yeah, supporting the uh, government. Yeah, Ambassador, you know, in, in one of the uh, seminars at the ISS that you participated in, you made a, a remark which has stuck with me uh, since more than a year and a half, two years ago. You made the you made the you made the remark that development is about empowerment and independence, um, and uh, it is helping communities to become independent of the state and to empower them. And whereas in South Africa, exactly the reverse is, is happening. Uh, for a variety of reasons, given our huge levels of inequality and poverty, we are creating a culture of dependence um, and it is the government will come and uh, solve. Now, so I, I think that culture change, something that's also come up uh, previously, I think is very, very important. We, we, we have to find a way of changing our mindset I'm always um, struck by how 
unentrepreneurial many South Africans are, for example, compared to Kenyans and Nigerians and so on and so forth. But the other fact that we've been discussing is the relationship of the private versus government. And the way I look at this in a quite a simple way and that at low levels of development, government is hugely important, but then as you go up the GDP per capita curve, business and competition becomes more important. But given, of course, South Africa's inequality, this is, uh, 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 the government has a bigger role to play. So now I'd, I'd actually given that, I want to turn to South Africa's fiscal situation because um, there's a huge, debate at the moment um, in our newspapers and everywhere about uh, appropriate, so-called appropriate debt levels. According to Finance Minister Tito Mweni, a gross government debt will rise to about 81% uh, of GDP in this fiscal year, compared to a projection when he made in the beginning of the year about 66%, so about almost 20 percentage points more. And uh, according to him, South Africa's debt levels will exceed 100% of GDP by 2024, 2025, and then rise to about 114% by 2028, 2029. So this issue of debt to GDP ratio is uh, something as uh, interesting as growth versus inequality when it comes to uh, economic debates. Uh, so um, what in your view is the implication of South Africa's deepening debt crisis for, for recovery? Yes, I think it's because exactly of this kind of situation where government has to spend more, that you need to have a strong growth and strong industry and economy uh, in the ordinary times. And the South Africa has to fight, you know, the, you know, on the two front lines. First, the need to stimulate by spending more, but also, um, you know, the, addressing the fundamental questions of you know, structural reform uh, that has been you know, delayed. So now the problem is uh, because uh, the world is in you know recession or rather you know in crisis. Uh, what you know 2008, how financial crisis uh, began in the first place was because at that time already the interest rates were very low, but the central bank in the United States started to uh, uh, raise the interest rates, and that's why you got this uh, Lehman Brothers and everything. So uh, the financial institutions, you know, they're very careful. They don't want to raise, you know, interest rates and interest rates are very low and the, the means are very limited. So not much can you can do with the monetary policies. So now the fiscal policies, because uh, uh, during the recession, if you are sticking to austerity, then it gets worse, like you know, what happened in Greece. So that is not also, you know, advisable. So there has to be uh, injection you know, in the economy uh, by means of spending. So the borrowing, uh, you know, comes as an option. So those countries uh, which have enough in their coffers to spend lavishly trillions of dollars, you know, they are lucky. So they are, you know, envied, and uh, that's the kind of uh, readiness that uh, South Africa should have uh, in the normal times. But that's not you know, the situation now. So I understand there needs to be borrowing, but I think what is important is uh, when you borrow, uh, not to not let, let that just to be you know wasted, uh, because it will you know incur more borrowing without having any effect. So I think this is a moment uh, when government plays an important role of directing the resources, the very valuable resources that it has borrowed uh, directly to go to the needed you know, uh, areas and without you know, diversions. So this is very crucial. And that has a kind of a, you know, a, a effect of also gaining the confidence of uh, you know, monetary institutions. So IMF, World Bank, and other countries. So uh, Mr. Tito Umbeni is right. You know, he wants to manage very well, but the dilemma is on the other side, there's a need to stimulate the economy. Mm. Yeah. And that can be done by really focusing on how the funds are you know, distributed and really you know, checking, really uh, supervising well so that uh, those, are, those effects, the values are not lost on the ground. Yeah. And uh, how, how do you see it? Do you have a magic figure or how, how, how do you see it? Well, certainly don't have a magic figure. I think it's important to get the facts right. The, the first thing is that 
South Africa's fiscal crisis is dampening our growth prospects dramatically. And it's interesting, concerning that most of the recovery strategies, the business one, the ANC one, the NEDLAC one, is don't recognize, they all, you know, pay homage. Yeah, we've got a fiscal crisis, but then all their recommendations, they want lots more money. So how the fiscal crisis affects our recovery needs to be thought through carefully. On the other hand, we have to appreciate that without growth, we won't get out of our fiscal crisis. So there's a very intimate relationship here, and I don't think the country is focusing nearly enough attention on this. The fact is we have to cut expenditure. How you do this and when are issues for debate, how quickly and when. Um, but you know the, the cost of servicing South Africa's debt is rising faster than any other item on the budget. So we are gobbling the present and the future of sort of eating, the past is eating up our future. That is the key. So um, we have to deal with this. We have to be very serious about how we deal with this. I don't think they're magic numbers. Um, we certainly support a lot of what the Treasury has, is trying to do. But even the Treasury at its best, two things are important in the supplementary budget in July. Um, you know, and in February, that even if we did everything the Treasury is asking for, we do not stabilize the debt in three years' time. So it's, that's not enough. You've got to get growth. And the Treasury's assumptions about growth are very, very, very modest. So it looks like they assume no fundamental reforms. And that comes back to the very first thing I said. South Africa cannot get out of its multiple crises including the fiscal crisis, unless we, we, we turn direction. We've got to change in fundamental ways. And I just, I want to just bring up something that I find a useful sort of image. On the one hand, I, I absolutely agree the business narrative needs some work, um, but I think we have to be careful. You know, you look at what business has come forward and it's a, you know, it's a hundred pages, it's a thousand pages of all the reforms they want sector by sector. The truth is, some, you know, you can have this way. Captain's on a cruise ship and they're going to the captain, the captain and they want to complain about, I don't know, the planning rules, the, this, the food, the, my room isn't good enough and the service is terrible. All important issues. But the real issue is that the ship is heading towards a hurricane. And I would like a lot more attention on the hurricane as the foundation for the choices we make and the priorities we have to, to focus on. And the fiscal crisis is absolutely a part of that. And I think everyone wants to put it in one box and hope it goes away and it doesn't really affect our growth plans. Let's spend. Um, big, big risks. I agree with the ambassador. You're borrowing money. You know, infrastructure, the new silver bullet, everyone's in favor of the new motherhood. But there are lots of questions to ask. One of which, in the fiscal context, is we will have to borrow some more money. And unless you spend that money well, so you can kind of get returns, we're, get, we're exposing the country to more risk than we, we already are in. So yeah. I think the part really important, much more attention needs growth and it's, it's dampening growth at the same time. Very difficult situation. Thanks, um, um, and you and Ambassador Park seem to be on the on the on the same page with this regards. We we probably need to uh, uh, borrow more money, but what do we do with it? So, um, Miriam, how, how do you see it? I uh, see so you've posted a link to an article on the 2020 budget in the chat function, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about your views. Yeah, so if I could just share a screen quickly, I know you've asked us not to uh, share too many slides, um, and I hope I can find it. There we go. <laughs> It's always tricky. So yeah, this is this is a see. this is a diagram. I hope everyone can see it. That uh, is going to be in a forthcoming uh, NPC paper. It should be out in a week or two. Uh, so <laughs> what what 
So, so um, as a commissioner, I've had a lot of discussions with Treasury about, about the fiscal pathway for, for many years. And, um, and the question that I've been putting to the budget office over the years has been, is our problem high debt or is our problem, in your view, or is the problem uh, not having a grip, right? Now, the thing is, is that as, as much as this looks high, it's high in a country with low savings, uh, that's, there's no doubt about that. But the problem here is not so much that the debt is high, but that, that we don't have a grip. That is what the problem is. Mm. So if you're a creditor, South Africa is not the worst country in the world. We can complain. And, and the fact that we can complain is a very good thing. You know, that you have voice and pushback and so on is something that will save the country. Uh, but we're not the worst country in the world. That's very true. And very true. so when, when creditors uh, are thinking about lending to us, they want to know, can you pay us back? Right? Not that the debt is high and not that it might not even get worse before it gets better, but do you have a narrative that helps explain how you're going to get from point A to point Z? And the problem right now in South Africa is not so much that the debt is high. And you would think that after the downturn, the debt would rise. It happened all over the world. And that after in COVID, that debt is going to rise. You can expect that to happen. The question is, do you have a productive narrative? Now, what this picture shows us, this is from various budgets. Now in 2017, the budget office raised a red flag and I'm not sure that the minister noticed because if I were the minister, I probably wouldn't have allowed it to be published. But I think Michael Sachs was head of the budget office at the time and they were raising a red flag and they said, look, we cannot with confidence forecast what the debt to GDP ratio might be. So we are going to say it may be, you know, well, I, I forget what it was, but maybe it'll be 49% or maybe it'll be 62. I can't, we, we can't say. Now that was a bit of a shock and not many people noticed it. It was a footnote, but certainly I noticed it and I keep reproducing this, this picture. Um, now, this is the latest one from the supplementary budget, and it says maybe it'll be 74 by 2028, or maybe it'll be 141. I don't know. Now, the budget office can't say that. I mean, they can say it, but what they're really saying is, let's not even talk about global risk. We are very susceptible to global risk because of being a small, open, uh, you know, minerals economy. But not even talking about that, the problem here that Treasury is trying to raise is about domestic risk. And when you're a country like South Africa, you have to try to strip out as much of the domestic risk as you can because we are so open to global risk, right? Because we, we just float with the fate of the, glo of, the, of the world, unfortunately. So now what are the key issues there? So the first is the SOE debt that is not under control and just keeps erupting. And that is linked to leadership. The leadership point that I was raising, CEOs, executive management, the appointment of boards, the accountability, the role of the ministries. So let's not even talk about big language that confuses us and makes us feel disempowered. Let's talk about what needs to happen and what we need to be talk, you know, what we need to be focused on. So the reason that the SOE, you know, there's corruption surely, but the reason that the SOE debt has run amok is because of those things I just raised. Politics getting involved, quality of the management of, of the board, a new CEO every single year over a period of a decade and all the key uh, entities. You know, one of the key differences at Telcom is that we had stable leadership, right? One, a new CEO, a new chairman of the board over a decade, every single year. But then when Sipo Maseko and Jabu uh, Mabuza came in, they were there for a period of time. Somehow we had protection against the politics. So anyway, SOE finances the public sector wage bill. And when I talk about that, what I mean is the state has to become strategic and having a long-term view. When the current arrangement was put in place, the minister went in without a mandate and signed off an agreement. So they have not, and, and now they need to get into the negotiation and yet again are moving into it very late in the day. So we need to start getting a better, uh, a proper negotiations and a long-term view that would enable some trade-offs. 
Thirdly, municipal finances are out of control. Again, that speaks to the, the undermining. I, I mean, we didn't have much of a local government system before, but now we need to, re, we need to rebuild it again. Then there's the capacity at revenue services that was undermined. And now we have Edward Kiswitter. And as we saw in the business day to day, there was, you know, he's saying, look, this is the one place where you can invest and get a return. So he's trying to get Treasury to be thinking about revenue services in that way. And raising revenue is the number one way of getting resources. Because when you borrow, you still have to pay it back. A lot of people forget that. Um, and then finally, it speaks to the point of quality of spending. You know, I've, I've raised a number of times, you know, maybe one of the things we should do is let's pick four big expenditure areas and have projects that are very common in the private sector, which would say, how do we improve service and do it more efficiently? And if I can just say, I've been personally been at the coal face of those exercises because that's what we did at Telecom. I ran the first process that said, okay, we are going to strip out 8 billion Rand worth of uh, operating expenditure and we're going to improve customer service. And the staff go, we can't do that. And I go, well, then we're going to be dead. Now, the difference between, you know, Telecom and say ESCOM is that Telecom will be dead because it's a competitive market and not too big to fail. But so, so, so you've got a cultural problem that there's that lack of accountability and a sense of competition that somehow, which is a typical public sector problem, that somehow needs to be infused with the regulatory capability, the approach of the ministry, the voice of citizens to try to infuse improved performance. Now, when I raised that idea of what we did at Telecom, which is very common in, in the private sector. When I raise, we need to do something like that. Let's pick even one example, people glaze over. They don't know what I mean. They wanna talk about cutting cost or um, you know, boring more. And it, it, there's a very static mindset, but there's no doubt that that idea of better value for money in big expenditure areas that there is so much runway that could be gained by focusing on that and so yeah. much opportunity to ra for raising productivity and even growth by improving the quality of spending. Rim, uh, excellent points. And I think we would all we would all agree with you. Can I ask you to Sorry, stop I'll, sharing yeah, the I'll, screen? I'll bring that down. Um, but thanks, that, that was very useful and, and I think very instructive. And I think we more or less all speaking the same same uh, the same language when it comes to accountability and and all of these issues but I would and and that was very useful I now want to turn the conversation to employment and and including employment in the informal sector because um, uh, we've been this this issue between employment and growth and unemployment and, and so on has been uh, a consistent strain in in our discussions um, and uh, previously we referred to to gear and the there's a whole mythology around gear but it is the only time when South Africa grew and when employment grew. But of course, it's politically incorrect to, to speak about that. There's a whole um, uh, school of thought uh, that uh, denigrates that. But um, my research tells me that only sustained employment growth in the formal sector of the economy would unlock a reduction in inequality. And um, so I want to share a graph um, that uh, I, uh, yeah, that I um, enjoy and that I find very instructive. It's basically show, shows the relationship between employment and growth in South Africa from 2000 uh, until 2018. And um, GDP growth is the blue line and employment is the, is the red line or the orange line, I'm colorblind. So, but you can, there's a clear correlation. So it goes back to the point that we had right at the beginning of the relationship between employment uh, and, and growth and the need for, for rapid economic growth. And I generally picture the South African growth engine as a train sort of with three carriages. And the growth engine uh, is a growth in the formal sector that pulls and increases uh, employment in the informal sector, which is the, for the first coach behind the engine. And then we have to undertake mass uh, job creation schemes for the unemployed in the second carriage. But the, the train doesn't move forward without an engine. Um, and uh, instead of rapid growth in the formal sector, we are in desperation, in my view, uh, trying to look at the informal sector as some kind of savior, some kind of sponge that's going to absorb our desperation. And in actual fact, on comparative basis, South Africa is quite a small informal sector compared to most other African countries. Uh, it certainly can save as a cushion and absorb people not economically active, but it's not a source of sustainable productivity growth. 
Um, so, Anne, how do you see it? Amongst others, you've recently been quite vocal about inform the informal sector and the lack of actual government support in spite of considerable rhetoric from the president and others. Am I, am I getting it uh, ter terribly, terribly wrong? Well, Yaki, let me start with the most important, which is the formal sector. I absolutely agree with you that the relationship between the formal and informal is fundamental. And one of the myths that we need to dispel in South Africa is that somehow the informal sector will grow, will sort of cushion crises and will grow and all sorts of romantic ideas about the informal sector. I don't share these. I think that what's really important is that we grow formal sector firms. And if you look at South Africa's unemployment, which is catastrophic. Um, we released a big report on this in January this year, uh, 10 million and rising is the unemployment number that we think is, is um, the one to think about. And now with COVID probably um, grown by sort of at least 2 million or more. We don't know how many of those jobs will not come back. Um, so this is really the big issue in South Africa. And it relates to growth. There are lots of people who want to have a conversation about growth, and then they want to have a conversation about, so how are we going to deal with unemployment? What projects do you want to talk about? I don't want to talk about projects. I want to talk about how we get our economy set up for much faster growth and for much more labor intensive growth. And as I said at the beginning, there are two buckets of fundamental reforms that are required to do both. The informal sector is kind of, you know, shrinks and expands according to what's happening in the formal sector. Um, so I would put much more energy on the formal sector jobs, far less attention to projects and initiatives. CDE has, I don't know what the right word is, sarcastically said that in our view, the <laughs> most possible, um, the most the best kind of jobs, the most expandable, are called firms. And those are the, that's what we have to focus on. How do we get the environment right to get more and more new firms, small firms that become medium-sized firms, and save our big firms and them to expand? So I think that's the framework within which to think about this. South Africa, there is a reason that... South Africa is a complete outlier in terms of the proportion of our workforce that are actually working. It's incredibly low. It has to do with our rural areas and it has to do with the structure of, of work. That, you know, we had this image. We had a strategy of high skill, high wage employment and this was the development strategy the ANC was wedded to. And that explained a whole lot of things. And this has failed, dismally. An empirical test, we failed. Now, the rest of the world, unless you discover oil, went a very different route. Many, many low-skill jobs and a kind of progression. People could get a foot in the workforce, get some know-how connections, and then move up from my T-shirt to your shirt. Uh, assembling toys to assembling iPhones, which is where Bangladesh is now, not just very, very cheap clothes, but also getting into some of the electronic value chains. But South Africa said, no, not for us, we're gonna do something else. Well, we, we have the results to show for it, which are, as I've said, rising and a, an absolute disaster for the country, for the people involved and so on. So. I think you've got to think about employment issues in terms of growth. Firstly, we have to get faster growth in terms of more labor intensive growth, encourage as much as possible without obviously harming the, the more skilled parts of our economy. And then we've got to think about place. Where does growth happen? How do we make our cities? We're nearly 70% urbanized and rising. How do we make our cities much more hospitable places for newcomers to get jobs, to start a firm, and to move around the city to even get to a job interview. So that's how I would be thinking 
about the jobs question in overall and the informal sector is is important we're actually trying to learn a lot more about this at cde over the next sort of we've got three webinars coming but this is not a place of enormous potential i think that you've got to look to the formal sector first and foremost not stop informal sector activity uh, but look at how we improve the business environment so that we make it worth firms while to become a bit more formal it progressively over time. Thanks, Anne. Um, we, we rapidly run out of time. So, um, Miriam, um, why does government not allow for more labor market flexibility in the economy and, and allow for more employment growth in the formal and the informal sector? And I, I must ask, I must apologize. Please keep the responses quite short. Okay. Uh, I didn't realize we, we, we had run so much, uh, eaten up so much of our time. Look, I think I just wanted to, you know, since, since we're, we're closing I, now, I know you wanted to close on time. Uh, if I can just um, actually support what Anne was just saying, I, I would say that we should not be fetishizing the informal sector. The issue is that we want more small firms. We want firms to be able to grow. We want them to be able to thrive. The regulatory environment in some ways is quite conducive actually to that. But uh, you know, there are obviously areas that, that, that need improvement, but a lot of it, this is where I really agree with Anne, uh, no doubt projects are great, but we've had a pretty consistent relationship, as you've said, uh, for every 1% GDP growth, we get about uh, 0.6 to 0.7% mm, yeah. of employment growth. And so what we need to do, which is why the NPC is focused on the cross-cutting issues, we need to get going with you know, the infrastructure, the state capacity, the education, human resource capacity uh, and, 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 and the institutions that support small business entry and growth, uh, no doubt. And the projects are kind of nice to have, but the, the foundations and, and the, urban, the urban story, which is really, you know, Anne's, uh, you know, what Anne's background is in any, any case is absolutely key. The, the, the functioning of an urban, uh, the well-functioning of an urban space in a South African context is one of the, probably one of the most important things that needs to happen so that people get information, they can exchange, they can move around. It's one of the things that really holds a barrier. Yeah. No, that, that's very true. And, and uh, should I just add the colliery to that, that is um, uh, land reform in the formal uh, homelands is the way to unlock uh, a poverty um, uh, improvements in poverty in, in, in South Africa, also something that I should add, we've seen absolutely no movement on. But Ambassador Park, you probably have the last, um, the last word uh, uh, for our seminar today. What role did the formal and the, and the informal sector play in South Korea's development uh, trajectory? Are we going off on a tangent here? Ambassador Parks, I don't see you. I hope you are still there. <laughs> I think I think we have uh, we may have lost uh, Ambassador Park, but we are two minutes um, uh, before the the time that we wanted to close. There are a number of areas we didn't get to. Um, South Africa's uh, energy challenge, uh, um, uh, infrastructure, industrialization, and trade, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, we 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 didn't manage to get to all of those. But what I found remarkable. Despite the um, South Africa, we always get trapped into sort of very clear uh, where we come from, and then you are not listened to because of who you are and where you come from. But I found the synergy and the uh, uh, sense of uh, a common understanding of many of the challenges that we've been speaking. I found I found quite remarkable. I don't see any questions in the, um, um, I see lots of comments and sharing of information, but I don't really see any specific questions um, from, uh, from our participants, which means that in actual fact, we can uh, conclude on time and in time. So I want to say thanks, um, Anne Bernstein, to you and CDE, you do remarkable work. So I'm a great fan and a great follower of the work that CDE does. Miriam, for the work that you're putting at the National Planning Commission and elsewhere, it's great to see that kind of innovation and thinking outside of the box. It really is useful to us. And to Ambassador Park and uh, the book that he wrote on comparing South Korea and um, uh, Africa, I think it's a great read, it's accessible. And I want to leave you with that message that he told me so about probably two years ago. Development is about independence and about empowerment. It is not about dependence. 
And this is where South Africa, I think we have a long road uh, to travel in that regard. I want to say thank you to all the participants, to the ISS and the Embassy of the Republic of Korea for hosting this event. I've certainly le learned a lot, and I hope that you have as well. Thank you very much. It's exactly 11.30, and we conclude our discussion.